this is a subject of almost as breathtaking interest as the independence debate, uh, and one you'll all have your fingers on uh, and all be uh, up to scratch with, I'm sure. Um, I might get on the stage, actually. Um, if you had stood... Can we get this working? If you had stood on the Lahore Gate uh, of the Red Fort of Delhi uh, in about 1640 uh, and looked out across the Red Fort with all its princely dwellings over to the Jama Masjid, the great Friday Mosque, uh, in about 1640, you would have been standing at the heart of the largest and most powerful Muslim empire that ever existed. Its population outnumbered that of its nearest rival, the Ottoman Empire, by about five to one. Uh, and uh, uh, its uh, land space outnumbered the Safavids, the Iranians, about two to one. Uh, and it controlled almost all of modern India, all of modern Pakistan and Bangladesh, quite a lot of modern Burma, um, almost all of, in 1640, almost all of modern Afghanistan, and a sliver uh, of modern Iran. And such was the impression of the power and the might of the ruler of this great empire, the great Mughal himself, that the word Mughal has permanently latched itself onto the English language so that this evening if you look in your mail on Sunday and read about some scandal involving a property mogul or a Hollywood mogul, uh, that, is a, uh, that word mogul is not a, a general term, it's a very particular name of a dynasty uh, of Mongol and Turkish, mixed Mongol and Turkish descent that arrived in India in the 16th century that conquered this great empire. And for the Europeans, for the Tudors and Elizabethans who first turned up from this island to do business with these people, this was like arriving in Manhattan in the 1950s or Shanghai today. This was the hub of the richest, the fastest growing economy in the world uh, and one of the best ordered uh, and best run uh, administrations in the world. And the Tudors tumbling around in their cod pieces uh, are like sort of figures from a Bruegel uh, canvas, these sort of slightly absurd figures uh, trying to get a part of the action. They weren't there as part of a sort of Elizabethan version of the Oxfam advert, you know, send five pounds and help Sita regain her sight that you also see in the Mail on Sunday. Um, uh, this, was, this was peripheral traders from a distant and uncivilized part of the world uh, trying to get part of the action of the richest and most powerful empire of its time. And what's interesting about the Mughals for us today is not so much that it, just that they were enormously rich and ruled a huge area uh, and ordered it and had a, a, a fantastically well-run administration that turned it into the richest kingdom of the world. But what is interesting culturally is the way that uh, the Mughals brought together, for the first time really, the different cultures of South Asia and fused them into something new. And today I'm going to be talking about painting, um, which was something that the early British, indeed the British as a whole, took remarkably little interest in uh, at the time, um, but uh, which is one of its most dazzling um, inputs. And I'm particularly going to be talking about not, in a sense, the most famous period of Mughal painting, which was under the great rulers like, like Akbar and Shah Jahan, but the little-known painting at the end of the period. And this lecture is a spin-off from an uh, Asia Society show in New York that I put together a couple of years ago. Um, and um, if it doesn't seem to be of enormously uh, pressing interest to the borders today, uh, I hope there'll be some incidental pleasures, and there are a few passing links to this part of the world. When um, Milton was writing Paradise Lost, uh, and he wanted to give an impression 
uh, of the future wonders that mankind would produce. He decided in Paradise Lost to take, have God take Adam on a tour of the great cities of Mughal India. Uh, and this, as I say, was like, uh, was like, visiting, uh, it's like visiting Shanghai today, something miraculously fast-growing that wasn't there 10 years ago. Shah Jahanabad, this great city, springs up in a matter of five years when the Mughal commands that it should be re-inhabited. It was the old capital of that part of the world. Hadn't, no one had ruled in it for 200 years. Shah Jahan says, move back. And within three years, it's 1.5 million people, larger than London, Paris, and Madrid combined. Uh, and under Akbar, you get the beginning of Mughal painting. Akbar is illiterate, uh, but he loves stories. And every evening, he summons storytellers to the court. Uh, and he decides that the, the storytelling will be enhanced if he has the addition of the kind of Mughal equivalent of PowerPoint. Uh, he wants to be able to have people holding up large illustrations to the small group of maybe 100 courtiers. Um, smaller than a, a Beyond Borders audience, uh, that were a more select group even than this, uh, that would be gathered uh, to hear um, the tales of Hamza, uh, or one of the great stories of, of the East. Uh, and he commissions, uh, in about 1600, as about the same sort of time as Queen Elizabeth is, is on the throne in England, he commissions an enormous set of 250 illustrations, each about the size of that screen, a little bit smaller than that, but not much smaller. Uh, and there are no painters to paint it. So he brings in from Persia three or four masters of the Persian miniature style who are used to painting these very refined, very intimate, very intricate, geometric, flat paintings. And he gets them to train up 400 Gujarati Hindu painters who've been producing wall paintings and, uh, and Gujarati Hindu and Jain miniatures uh, in Gujarat. And he brings together, by doing this, two completely different traditions. The Jain West Indian uh, tradition of illustration is on, normally on palm leaves. Uh, it's enormously flat. Uh, if you want to show someone um, looking sideways, you have the, a profile face, and then you have an eye sticking out, out of the profile, if you see what I mean. It's uh, uh, in, into open space. Uh, it's a completely different tradition with very bright colors, uh, very free-flowing, free naturalistic forms. And he brings this together with the Persian form, and out of that, almost immediately, in this one commission of 250 enormous paintings, is born the Mughal miniature style. This then gets cross-fertilized instantly by Western art. If you had stood, can we get this working? If you had stood on the Lahore gate uh, of the Red Fort of Delhi uh, in about 1640 uh, and looked out across the Red Fort with all its princely dwellings, over to the Jama Masjid, the great Friday Mosque, uh, in about 1640, you would have been standing at the heart of the largest and most powerful Muslim empire that ever existed. Its population outnumbered that of its nearest rival, the Ottoman Empire, by about five to one. Uh, and uh, uh, its uh, land space outnumbered the Safavids, the Iranians, about two to one. Uh, and it controlled almost all of modern India, all of modern Pakistan and Bangladesh, quite a lot of modern Burma, um, almost all of, in 1640, almost all of modern Afghanistan, and a slither uh, of modern Iran. And such was the impression of the power and the might of the ruler of this great empire, the great Mughal himself, that the word Mughal has permanently latched itself onto the English language so that 
this evening if you look in your mail on Sunday and read about some scandal involving a property mogul or a Hollywood mogul, uh, that, is a, uh, that word mogul is not a, a general term. It's a very particular name of a dynasty uh, of Mongol and Turkish, mixed Mongol and Turkish descent that arrived in India in the 16th century that conquered this great empire. And for the Europeans for the Tudors and Elizabethans who first turned up from this island to do business with these people. This was like arriving in Manhattan in the 1950s or Shanghai today. This was the hub of the richest, the fastest growing economy in the world uh, and one of the best ordered uh, and best run uh, administrations in the world. And the Tudors tumbling around in their cod pieces uh, are like sort of figures from a Bruegel uh, canvas, these sort of slightly absurd figures uh, trying to get a part of the action. They weren't there as part of a sort of Elizabethan version of the Oxfam advert, you know, send five pounds and help Sita regain her sight that you also see in the Mail on Sunday. Um, uh, this, was, this was peripheral traders from a distant and uncivilized part of the world uh, trying to get part of the action of the richest and most powerful empire of its time. And what's interesting about the Mughals for us today is not so much that it just that they were enormously rich and ruled a huge area uh, and ordered it and had a, a, a fantastically well-run administration that turned it into the richest kingdom of the world. But what is interesting culturally is the way that uh, the Mughals brought together for the first time, really, the different cultures of South Asia and fused them into something new. And today I'm going to be talking about painting, um, which was something that the early British, indeed the British as a whole, took remarkably little interest in uh, at the time, um, but uh, which is one of its most dazzling um, inputs. And I'm particularly going to be talking about, not in a sense, the most famous period of Mughal painting, which was under the great rulers like, like Akbar and Shah Jahan, but the little-known painting at the end of the period. And this lecture is a spin-off from an uh, Asia Society show in New York that I put together a couple of years ago. Um, and um, if it doesn't seem to be of enormously uh, pressing interest to the borders today, uh, I hope there'll be some incidental pleasures. And there are a few passing links to this part of the world. When... Um, Milton was writing Paradise Lost, uh, and he wanted to give an impression uh, of the future wonders that mankind would produce. He decided in Paradise Lost to take, have God take Adam on a tour of the great cities of Mughal India. Uh, and this, as I say, was like, uh, was like some visiting, uh, is like visiting Shanghai today, something miraculously fast-growing that wasn't there 10 years ago. Shah Jahanabad, this great city, springs up in a matter of five years when the Mughal commands that it should be re-inhabited. It was the old capital of that part of the world. Hadn't, no one had ruled in it for 200 years. Shah Jahan says, move back. And within three years, it's 1.5 million people, larger than London, Paris, and Madrid combined. Uh, and under Akbar, you get the beginning of Mughal painting. Akbar is illiterate, uh, but he loves stories. And every evening, he summons storytellers to the court. Uh, and he decides that the, its storytelling will be enhanced if he has the addition of the kind of Mughal equivalent of PowerPoint. Uh, he wants to be able to have people holding up large illustrations to the small group of maybe 100 courtiers. Um, smaller than a, a Beyond Borders audience, uh, that were a more select group even than this, uh, that would be gathered uh, to hear um, the tales of Hamza uh, or one of the great stories of, of the East. Uh, and he commissions uh, in about 1600, as about the same sort of time as Queen Elizabeth is, is on the throne in England, he commissions an enormous set of 250 illustrations, each about the size of that screen, a little bit smaller than that, but not much smaller. Uh, and there are no painters to paint it. So he brings in from Persia 
three or four masters of the Persian miniature style who are used to painting these very refined, very intimate, very intricate, geometric, flat paintings. And he gets them to train up 400 Gujarati Hindu painters who've been producing wall paintings and, uh, and Gujarati Hindu and Jain miniatures uh, in Gujarat. And he brings together, by doing this, two completely different traditions. The Jain West Indian uh, tradition of illustration is on, normally on palm leaves. Uh, it's enormously flat. Uh, if you want to show someone um, looking sideways, you have the, a profile face, and then you have an eye sticking out, out of the profile, if you see what I mean. It's uh, uh, in, into open space. Uh, it's a completely different tradition with very bright colors, uh, very free-flowing, free naturalistic forms. And he brings this together with the Persian form. And out of that, almost immediately, in this one commission of 250 enormous paintings, is born the Mughal miniature style. This then gets cross-fertilized instantly by Western art, because at the same time as this is happening, the Emperor Akbar, who is, the, is in a sense, the, the, the Muslim emperor of all Muslim emperors, to destroy the stereotype of the, uh, that all Muslims are puritanical, autocratic, exclusive, anti-other religions. In a sense, he's the man to hold up as the opposite end of the spectrum to ISIS. And Akbar, at a time when in London, Catholics uh, are being hung, drawn, and quartered in the Tyburn uh, for their faith, Akbar is calling to Fatipur Sikri, his then capital outside Agra, Jews from Cochin, Jains from Gujarat, Zoroastrians from Surat, three or four different varieties of Hindus, Vaishnavites, Shaivites, different kinds of sadhu sects, Shia Muslims, Sunni Muslims, Sufi masters, Buddhists from the Himalayas, and to produce the first great multi-faith conference in about 1605 in a specially built room where each master of the different religious faiths sits in a corner of this room and stairwells connect to the center where Akbar is sitting. And he sets out a program saying, we must discover without the marshy land of tradition, the reality, the firm ground of reason. And so long before the Enlightenment, which we kind of think is a, as an exclusively Western thing, you have a Muslim emperor bringing different faiths together and commanding that they discuss religion and matters of faith in a rational way to try and arrive at a measure of the truth. There's nothing been like it happened in the Western world until about 300 years later. It's an extraordinary moment. And the painting in Akbar's court reflects this. He brings together these different traditions and produces this one style. And you get, by the time of Shah Jahan, when, when Shah Jahanabad is being built in the 1640s, um, this fabulous coming together of different religious traditions. And then it all starts to go wrong. And why it goes wrong is Akbar's great-grandson, Aurangzeb. And Aurangzeb is, is more of the ISIS variety. He's the kind of Oliver Cromwell of the Mughal world. He's a Puritan. He doesn't like music. He doesn't like painting. Uh, he, uh, he cancels uh, the uh, rather wonderful-sounding branch of the Mughal civil service, which is called the Offices of the Lords of Pleasure. Uh, and you can imagine the various things under their charge. Um, and in institutes instead a kind of morality religious police of the sort that you still have in Iran uh, as, a, as a countermeasure. Uh, and at that moment, all the Mughal painters who've been patronized, there are about 400 painters that travel around with the emperor under a series of masters. And whether he's going to Lahore or Kandahar or, uh, or to Bengal on campaign, these guys travel with him. And these guys are suddenly out of a job. 150 years, they've been churning out paintings, they've been looking at uh, the work of Jesuit uh, uh, gospel books brought from Portugal, they've absorbed some of the lessons of perspective from the Renaissance. If you look at the background of a lot of Mughal miniature scenes, you find uh, these wonderful sort of Tuscan landscapes with lines of cypresses and, uh, uh, and sort of you know, lovely sort of uh, holiday villas in the background. Uh, they also absorb into their painting a great deal of Portuguese religious art. Um, Akbar and Jahangir had particular devotions to the Virgin Mary, the, 
who incidentally appears more often in the Quran than she does in the Bible. She's mentioned more often in the Quran. Uh, and so they commission an enormous mural inside the imperial sleeping chamber in the palace at uh, Agra, an enormous mural of the nativity. Uh, and the only concession, so to speak, to, uh, to Islam is that in that, rather than being in a stable, as is the Christian tradition, the birth takes place under a palm tree. So the, the, the stable disappears and there's a palm tree instead. Otherwise, it's exactly the sort of thing you'd send to your cousins for Christmas. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is actually painted within the imperial sleeping chamber. So that the Jesuits write back, it looked more like that of a, uh, the, the chamber of a Christian king than that of a Moor. So this tradition, which reaches its peak uh, with Shah Jahan and Jahangir, suddenly is destroyed overnight by the diktats of Aurangzeb, who says this is un-Islamic. And these painters, many of whom are not Muslim, many of whom are Hindu, but have been trained up in the uh, Mughal tradition, in a Mughal court, disappear off back home or in search of patronage. Uh, and so many go to Rajasthan, a lot go to the Punjab hills, where in the 18th century there's a fantastic revival of painting right up in these beautiful valleys that look very like the borders. Champa, uh, Kangra, Gulair, these little, uh, this extraordinary moment in 18th century Himalayas, when you, it's rather like, um, I suppose, 16th century Tuscany, when you each, each little town has its own little state and has its own regional style, its own painting style, uh, and you can immediately, by looking at it, tell immediately where, which, which town such and such a painting is from. And this is the, what happens for 100 years. And traditionally, in normal accounts of, of Mughal painting, this is the end of Mughal painting. But there actually follows two extraordinary periods after this, which is what I'm going to talk about now. Um, there is a succession of quick-lived emperors who follow Aurangzeb, Bahadur Shah I, and so on. But it's under uh, Muhammad Shah II, Muhammad Shah Rangila, the colorful, that you get the first revival of painting. And this man, the colourful, is known for, he's an incredibly important patron of the arts. It, rather like the restoration after Charles II, uh, after Charles II's uh, execution, after the restoration, um, you, you bring back opera, you bring back musicals, the theatres reopen, painters come back to England. So in uh, Mughal India, with the uh, return of Muhammad Shah Rangila to the throne, the whole Puritan idea of Aurangzeb is out the window. And the painters come back. They come back from Rajasthan, they come back from the, the Punjab hills. But what they paint after their absence is something quite different. Gone is the geometric Persian paintings. Uh, gone is the, is, the, is the kind of influence of, of the Jesuits and this Renaissance style. Instead, you get these incredibly brightly colored images. And this is a period of great political tension. The empire is rather like the Roman Empire at around 400. Everything is cracking at the seams. It's still just holding the borders. But you can see in every district of the empire, insurgencies, rebellions, local governors refusing to send money to Delhi. In a million ways, the whole thing is tottering at the seams. It still rules all the way from Kabul down to Madras, from Bengal down to Goa, this vast land area. Uh, but it's all beginning to fragment. And in Delhi, the painting is almost a kind of uh, image of the escapism of the court at this period. There's, there's no pictures of bandits. There's no pictures of warfare. Shah Jahan loved to depict his great victories uh, in art. None of this happens with the later moguls. Instead, it's gardens, parties, fireworks, nauch girls, the emperor making love. You get the first erotic painting at this time. Um, elephant fights with the emperor looking down. Uh, and this is one of the great Pahari artists who returned to Delhi, a man called Nainsuk, who's one of the greatest of all Indian masters, a fantastic elephant. Um, and there's nothing in these paintings to indicate the warfare, rapine, and pillage, uh, and the imminent end of the empire. Because even as this painting is being painted in 1739, the Mughal's nemesis, the no Mughal's equivalent to Attila the Hun, is at the gates. And th in, in this case, it's a gentleman called Nadir Shah, who is the son of a Persian leather worker, a man of very humble origins, born 
uh, in northern Iran. And uh, he comes to power in Iran. He's an incredible, he uses matchlock technology in a way that's never been used before. His, his great forte uh, is to have cavalry, uh, fast moving cavalry, but using matchlocks. Uh, and these can outmaneuver the Mughal infantry and the, uh, the bowmen uh, of all these other armies. And in 1739, Nadir Shah is trying to capture Kandahar, which is the city that the Mughals and the Iranians have fought about for 150 years. And he notices, after a year and a half siege, that while the governor puts up an incredibly gallant siege, uh, sorry, incredibly gallant defense of Kandahar, the Mughals send no help from Delhi. They get no aid. There's no attempt to lift the siege. So after he takes Kandahar, he then moves on to Kabul. And again, nothing happens. There's no response from Delhi. So he comes down the Khyber Pass and he takes Peshawar. No response. He takes Lahore. No response. And this man, who has only 150,000 cavalry, each of them armed with the state-of-the-art matchlock, then decides to take Delhi. And finally, Muhammad Sharangila gets up from his parties and his fireworks and his, and his music and his painting, and he goes to take on Nadir Shah. And he summons all his governors. And 1.5 million Mughal soldiers meet 150,000 um, uh, Persians and are defeated within an hour. Uh, it's one of the great routes uh, of Indian history. Uh, and these Persians just simply charge through the Mughals. They are, all the Mughals have made this enormous encampment, which is first cut off. They besiege it. No food gets in. All the Nauch girls go home. You know, it's, all, it's a complete uh, fiasco. And then um, Muhammad Shah offers to come and negotiate. And he says, only if you do it in person. And he simply takes Muhammad Shah uh, prisoner and leads him to Delhi. And then it looks as if there's going to be some sort of um, uh, agreement, but s some of the Mughal soldiers murder a few of the Persians when there's a bizarre brawl. And there then takes place a massacre in the city of Delhi uh, when 15,000 people are killed in one day. And in the months that followed, Nadir Shah loots every house in Delhi and leaves with 10,000 wagons of gold, silver, and jewels. This is a man who was born in the, in the, into a leather-working factory. Uh, and he has so much spare that he sends off, I can't remember how many, 50 wagons, I think, each to the Ottoman Emperor, uh, to the French, and to the Russians, uh, just to show what he's got. And when you go to the top Kapi Palace today, the most magnificent room is not actually the Ottoman stuff. Uh, it's the Mughal stuff, which was the leftovers uh, of what Nadir Shah sent uh, to, the, uh, to the Ottomans. Uh, ditto in the Hermitage. There's ex extraordinary Mughal paintings and jewels which were given by Nadir Shah from his takings of Delhi. 10,000 wagons, the accumulated wealth of 200 years of empire. And this brings to an end this brief period of painting revival. This is Nadir Shah. Nadir Shah, I say, is, is, is another of these sort of slightly Oliver Cromwellish figures. Uh, a poet turns up in his camp when he's besieging Kandahar uh, and sings a poem in praise of, of Kandahar, uh, sorry, in praise of Nadir Shah. Nadir Shah is not a man who appreciates literary matters. He wouldn't be here in the audience today. Uh, and instead, he just sells the poet into slavery. Uh, and, uh, and then I, I think he sort of has his wife raped by the soldiers or something. This is, uh, he says, I, we don't do art in this army. Uh, we don't do poetry. Um, and there follows again another period when Delhi is looted and raped by a whole succession of different uh, of different forces. Um, uh, another man called Ghulam Qadir tries to hoover up what's left by Nadir Shah, and when the emperor says, I have nothing, because I've given already the Kohinoor, the Darya Noor, the Peacock Throne, it's all gone already, uh, Ghulam Qadir simply shoves his thumbs into Shah Alam's eyes and blinds him with his two thumbs, uh, leaving Shah Alam a blind emperor in a wrecked palace. And while all this is going on, exactly at the same time as this is going on, one of the most extraordinary things that ever happens in Indian history takes place. On the coast, miles away from here, in Madras and in Pondicherry, are two small trading companies. 
The East India Company is already 150 years old, but it's just traded like any other company in the world. There's nothing unusual about it in 1739. It has a single office in London with 100 metres of street frontage in Leadenhall Street in the city. The Compagnie des Anne, the French equivalent, is only 30 years old. Uh, and between them, they have, I think, 200 security guards covering, uh, 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 commanding their walls and uh, making sure no one enters the city at night and so on. 90, certainly, is the total garrison of Madras. And in 1739, they suddenly realised that with the Mughal emperor... Uh, impotent, with all his gold and silver taken, with all the governors now free to do what they like, these little trading companies in their small forts with their uh, fewer security guards than a large bank in London go their own way. They start minting their own coins, they start trading their own armies. And within 60 years, the East India Company has transformed itself into this extraordinary beast which eats up South Asia. A company, a corporation, eats up a subcontinent. It's the most dramatic example of corporate irresponsibility uh, in world history. You think, I know, Microsoft with armies or Pepsi-Cola with nuclear weapons or something would be the modern equivalent. There is no modern equivalent. Uh, and, and it remains a company. People talk blithely about the British conquering India. The British did not conquer India. A company conquered India, a company which remains in this headquarters in Leadenhall Street. It has one branch. It is 100 metres long, that branch office. As late as the 1800s, it employs only 30 people in London, a few secretaries. Uh, and then there's a, it has a semi-detached dock, which is run by about another 10 people. Other than that, it remains a corporation. But it takes advantage of this anarchy, the Afghans coming in, looting, the Persians coming in, looting, Mughal emperors blinded. And in a very, very short period, the East India Company gobbles up all this. And everything that you might think a company would do, it does do. It uh, you know, instantly makes it impossible for Indian traders to operate in territory it controls. It actively, at one point, begins cutting the thumbs off Indian weavers so that they can't compete with British uh, imports. Um, uh, it, there is this period lasts only, I'm thank thankful to say, only about 20 years. But there is a period of, of, sort of unbridled mercantile anarchy in Bengal that leads to this massive famine, which in turn leads to the impeachment of Warren Hastings, uh, who is in fact the wrong character. Warren Hastings is this rather benign character who has tried to um, shore up and, and reform this company. But they get the wrong end of the stick for personal reasons in London, and they impeach the good guy, in a sense. The real baddie is Clive of India. Clive of India uh, by, uh, runs off with £250,000 back to England at a time when £5,000 can buy a large townhouse in Buckley Square. Um, and so th there is a massive wholesale loot. And the British government goes along with this in return for an annual subsidy from the company. The company pays the British government £400,000 a year for its charter, and all that money is coming from India. Uh, they can rape, they can pillage, they can torture in Bengal and just send the money back, and the British government stamps it for the price of 400,000 a year. It's an extraordinary moment, but it is an all black and white. And when the British get to Delhi, something quite extraordinary happens. This is a man called Sir David Octoloni, originally from Persia, uh, went to America, where his family had set up in Boston, fought on the losing side in the American War of Independence, fled America at the fall of New York and the fall of Yorktown, uh, and ends up in India, never get leaves again. And in contrast to the rape of Bengal in the 1770s and 1780s, by the time uh, someone like Octoloni gets to Delhi, the British have acclimatized themselves in India to a certain extent. You can't join the East India Company after the age of 16. You have to apply at the age of 15, get your papers in, and take ship at the age of 16. So these guys who are running, you know, of age to run districts and so on are 25, 30, and they've spent half their life in India. They speak Indian languages, and by the time they've got to Delhi, there's a whole body of company servants who, for a, in an odd way, reverse the, the current of colonization. And rather than imposing British ways on India, they fall in love with Mughal culture and are themselves culturally colonized by the Mughals. So Octoloni, who here is shown in his company red coat, 
is very happy uh, to appear in the uh, Mughal Durbar. You can see him with his company red coat on and his tricorn hat among all the other nobles, humbly taking his place in the Mughal court. And the, uh, the, Mughals, uh, the, the British govern India officially as the Mughals' tax collectors. This is their, uh, this is their uh, nominal role. Uh, they take the diwani, which means the governorship of Bengal. Now, the reality is that they are a, an aggressive corporate power that's trying to expand, but the uh, legitimizing cloak of, uh, uh, of legitimacy, which covers this whole operation, is the fact that they are themselves supposedly Mughal servants. Uh, and within that, you get this sort of thing happening. This is a picture which turned up about 30 years ago, uh, which transformed our understanding, not only of Octoloni, really what the Brits were about at this period. Octoloni here is, seeing, is seen sitting not in his company uh, red coat, um, bossing people around and, and uh, sitting in the tricorn hat. He's wearing a sort of fab India kurta. Uh, he's sitting against a, uh, a, 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 a bolster. He's smoking a hooker. It's not entirely clear what he's smoking, judging by the slightly glazed look on his face, which I'm not sure you can see in this slide. Uh, it's quite possibly not tobacco. Uh, he's enjoying looking at his dancing girls, very appropriate way of showing a man who famously had no less than 30 Indian wives, each of whom had her own elephant. Uh, and every evening they would go on a wonderful tour around the Red Fort and then return, one imagines, for an evening's entertainment like this. And best of all, if you look on the top of the picture rail, uh, there's wonderful pictures of all Octoloni's outraged Scottish ancestors and their, and their, their tartan and the plumes of Highland regiments. Um, wondering what's happened to Ur Devi after a few years uh, in the Indian sun. Uh, and well, they might ask, because Octoloni made a very profound journey. It wasn't just a cosmetic thing of dressing up in Indian clothes. He, uh, uh, he learns Persian. He has a Persian seal, which he uses to seal all his uh, uh, documents with. It reads Nazir Daula in Persia, uh, the pillar of the state. Uh, Nazirabad in Rajasthan is actually named after Octoloni. Not many people, when they go to Nazirabad, realize it's named after a Scot, uh, for the understandable reason that Nazirabad doesn't sound a very Scottish name, but it is named after Sir David Octoloni. He builds this extraordinary building, which is, I think, a very important building to remember. It's destroyed in 1857, doesn't exist anymore, but there's this, this picture of it. Uh, this is Octoloni's tomb for his senior Indian wife, Mubarak Begum. In the center is a dome based on Brunelleschi's dome in Florence. On the top, it has a cross. Around it, you have two side wings. The, the domes in the side wings are timorid, ribbed, melon-shaped domes. And over both the side wing and the main wing is a forest of minars and minarets. You have the minaret and the cross together on a single building in the way that Akbar would have understood, but certainly most uh, um, British politicians of the moment would not. Uh, and this is, a, um, this is a precious moment when you have uh, a sort of balance of power in North India. And the fact that there is this um, balance of military and economic power, this is before the British have really established themselves as the hyperpower, when it is one power among many, this is the sort of period when you have cultural exchange going on. And it happens in spades in the painting of this period. Uh, this is a picture uh, of Akbar Shah, the second uh, emperor uh, after the British arrived, uh, with the Reverend Archibald Seaton uh, of this parish. He's, he's from uh, uh, just south of Edinburgh, near Peebles. Uh, this is the closest I could get to a link with <laughs> the borders in this talk. Uh, Archibald Seaton, you can see, is, is sitting in a position of almost reverence with his hands up in front of the uh, uh, Mughal emperor. And uh, young company servants arriving at this point take on this whole cultural exchange. The best example in terms of uh, images is my wife's ancestor, William Fraser, in whose house I was staying last night. And here he is, age 16, about to go out to India, painted in Edinburgh by Rayburn on his way out to India. And you can see slight, you know, familiar, slightly s s snotty Scots toff uh, with a, a sense of uh, uh, appropriation, those slightly closed eyelids uh, uh, that are the firm mouth, uh, the sense of entitlement. But look what happens when he arrives in Bengal. Here he is. He's still got his tam on, but he's beginning to go 
a bit Indian, and you can see he's wearing his, uh, his Indian uh, uh, jama, and, and what is not maybe immediately apparent as Indian, but very important, he's got his Persian calligraphy pens uh, in his hand. Um, and here he is when he arrives in Delhi. This is him and his friend Ahmed Bakhsh Khan having a smoke of an evening. Uh, and here he is in this rather sort of dashing uh, jama with, again, his hookah. Um, and you can see that he's become a total Mughal gentleman. Uh, and it, the key, key thing to keep in mind is that, go back, it's just the, the growing facial hair in each of the... <laughs> quick fast forward. <laughs> um, and Fraser commissions the great masterpiece, the greatest masterpiece of late Mughal art. And it's often referred to as company school art because the, uh, uh, the uh, patron, William Fraser, uh, was a company servant. But it's an almost meaningless term because the painters are all late Mughal painters, painting in a pretty well late Mughal style. But what is different, there's a number of things very important different. First of all, William Fraser wants to use his paintings as a way of understanding the country that he's fallen in love with and that he's helping to rule. So this painting, for example, is the village uh, uh, that he's called upon uh, to be the, uh, the district collector of. And each one of these gentlemen has a number next to him. And there's a little biography uh, in the writing over here. And so the young one is the tasseldar, this one is the ploughman, this one is the... And these two are William, servant, William Fraser's uh, secretary and accountant with the land grants of the village at their feet. And they're all bundled up, all the tax there. And this was, this, but these are not sort of caricatures or, uh, you know, this is not uh, a ploughman. These are actual portraits oozing character. And they are the first time in Mughal art that this sort of thing has been done for an ordinary ploughman or an ordinary buffalo keeper or whatever. Normally, you'd have this fantastic tradition of portraiture, but it's reserved for the nobles and the, uh, and the governors. This is the ordinary people. And the reason he's taking quite such an interest in this is that his girlfriend comes from the village and his sons are brought up there. And here are the two young Fraser boys, left and right, uh, who are part of the village uh, which he is ruling. And here are his in-laws. Uh, who he employs in his guard. This is his girlfriend in the middle, uh, and this is uh, Jan Fishan Khan, a.k.a. later known as Charles Fraser when he tries to apply for company employment, the young guy uh, on the left of the girl. Um, and he, he, he commissions portraits of all the men in the village. Each of them has a name. Uh, he also commissions portraits of the local knobs. This is the, uh, this is the kind of the Burke's peerage of, of, of the area. And again, you can see one, two, three, four, five. There's, a, there's another counter page uh, with all the descriptions of who they are. He makes his money in addition to being uh, a company servant. He trades I horses in Afghanistan. Uh, and these are the Afghan traders. He's on the first British mission to Kabul uh, in 1809, to, sorry, to Peshawar. And he makes contacts there with various Afghan horse breeders. And they come down every uh, winter and sell their horses in India. In India, horses to this day decline. And it's one of the great important factors in Indian history uh, is that uh, the most powerful people are those who have the access to horses. So if you're in Delhi, you get access to the horses of Central Asia. If you are in the Deccan, you, get, uh, uh, you can get horses shipped across the Gulf. Uh, but for some reason, biologically, horses do not thrive in Indian conditions. And you need to keep getting new uh, bloodstock brought in. These guys do it, and they're paid at a premium, and Fraser gets 10% of all the sales. Uh, so these guys are an important part of his economy. Again, more local knobs, but he also takes an interest in the religion of the area. This is a, a fakir who sits outside his gate, who's a Shaivite, and there's a long description of, of his different austerities. Fraser is the first person to employ Gurkha soldiers. Uh, he takes part in the Gurkha War of 1815, and this is the first Gurkha ever recruited. Uh, an extraordinary survival to the present day. He likes doing a bit of before and after stuff. Uh, this is his bearer as he arrived from the fields of Haryana with this rather sort of slipshod uh, turban on the left. And this is what he looked like after a good bath and a nice new uniform. Uh, it's the same guy. Um, and Fraser is a great Napoleon uh, uh, aficionado. Uh, when he hears that... Uh, Napoleon is sitting in St. Helena without a library. Fraser sends his entire Oriental manuscript collection 
overnight. He's, this, he's, he's that sort of crazy character who can't do anything by halves. He sends the whole lot to, to, to Napoleon, and it sinks on the way. So everything he's gathered in Delhi. Yeah, but Napoleon hears that he's sent it, and he sends back to Delhi the two last things that he has, which is his signet ring uh, and a bust of him by Canova. Uh, and the bust remains in Delhi through the 1857 uprising, uh, when it is, uh, disappears, and it's found again after the uprising, uh, rather suitably, in a Shiva temple, being worshipped as the great god Shiva. Uh, uh, and uh, in tribute to Napoleon, he gives his own household cavalry uh, a kind of Napoleonic hussar's outfit. Uh, it's not a British uniform, that. It's a Napoleonic one. And uh, to add to the final touch, there's the Fraser crest, the heart's head on the, on the cross belt. Um, he commissions the first uh, architectural views uh, of India painted in watercolour. His friend, James Skinner, who's half, per, uh, half Perthshire, uh, as opposed to Persia, half Perthshire uh, and half uh, Rajput, uh, also takes on the same painters. And he gets uh, Skinner to, he gets the same painters, Ghulam Ali Khan and his family, to paint pictures of their horse breeding operation that they run together, of Skinner's horse, his regiment. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the regiment going off to fight in the first Afghan war, which I spoke about here two years ago. Uh, there's pictures of the Norch girls, of the opium addicts, uh, of the church which Skinner builds in Delhi, St. James's Church, of their local neighbours. This is a former Norch girl called uh, the Begum Samru, who becomes a landowner in her own right and also employs uh, a lot of late Mughal painters. Uh, this is Nawab of Jaja going for a ride on his tiger, as one does in the afternoon. No King Charles Spaniels in Jaja. Um, and here he is in his uh, winter dress. And all this goes on for about 30 years, and then it dries out when the British achieve hyperpower spaces. When they suddenly get rid of the French, they defeat Tipu Sultan, uh, and, they, uh, and by 1830 they are the supreme power, suddenly there is a change. During this earlier period, one in three British men in India was married to an Indian woman. That, that's about, eight, uh, about 1800. By 1805 or it's 1810, it's down to about one in four. We know this because all the wills of the company servants survive in London and the, uh, the old Leadenhall Street archives have complete wills for every single company uh, employee. They have to send a copy home because so many of them die in the field and there's, the company gets troubled by litigation. So one of the early laws that they have is that everyone must make a will, a will gets sent home, and so we have exact details of the marital arrangements of every single company servant at this period. One in four leave everything to an Indian woman or an Anglo-Indian child in 1800. Con totally contrary to the Victorian idea that the British never intermarried in India. They did, which is where the Anglo-Indian community comes from. By, but it's a short-lived period. It's, it's uh, 1780 to 1800 is the peak, and it goes into decline. It's down to one in four by 1810, one in five company servants and an Indian wife by 1820, 1840, it's down to about one in eight, and 1850, by the time of the Great Uprising, it's all more or less over. So you move from a world which is more multicultural than modern South London, more interbred, more intermarried, greater, uh, more families that have two different religions in one household, or two different sets of cultures, or two different cuisines, or two different ways of sitting on the floor. But it goes from that to almost total apartheid by 1850, a warning to us today that multiculturalism is not something which is a kind of a necessary forward move. It can go in reverse as quickly as it happens. And you can move from a world where people are intermarried, where different cultures coexist with a measure of, uh, of tolerance uh, and happiness with each other, to total exclusion. This thing is, uh, ha there are fashions in liberalism as there are fashions in everything else. And the man who brings on the apartheid in Delhi is this man. Uh, Charles Metcalfe. You can see already by the time he arrives in 1830, he's not going to dress up in the pajama. He's sitting there in black and white, uh, more resolutely monotone amid the very uh, lovely colours of the Mughal court. And uh, Metcalfe uh, won't have any nonsense about uh, Indian wives or liking Indian music. Or one, the one concession he has is he still commissions Indian artists. And so he commissions this lovely album for his daughter, showing him and his brother going off riding in elephants and this sort of thing. The final emperor, Bahadur Shah Zafar, brings this moment of coexistence to a final climax. 1832, he comes to the, uh, the court, uh, comes to power. He's almost completely powerless by this stage. He has no army, he has no money, 
Uh, there's almost nothing he can do, but he still produces this extraordinary last renaissance in poetry. Poets are cheap. If you are an artistic, um, uh, artistically minded uh, Medici, you can afford being a banker to pay for uh, the greatest artists of the day or even to build uh, a Duomo like uh, Brunelleschi. But you can't, uh, if you're an artistically minded pauper, the one thing you can still do is sponsor poets. Uh, and Bharashal Zafar brings to fruition the Mughal guzzle. It is to Persian poetry and Urdu poetry in India the, s the equivalent of the court of Elizabeth for English poetry. It's the great, it's or, or English drama. Uh, and Zafar is this extremely cultured man. He's shown here. Uh, he's a calligrapher. This is him uh, at work, his calligraphy. This is an example of his calligraphy. He's a poet in six different languages uh, and a good poet in three. Uh, this is his poetic notebooks. You can see he doesn't have enough money to buy lots of little moleskins, but every corner is used up with little couplets, left and right, left and right. Uh, every corner of the notebook used up. He also has a very good line in hats. <laughs> uh, but it's under him, at this last great renaissance, that things begin to sour. And in 1857, the sepoys from Mirut, veterans from the Afghan war who've been deserted by their uh, officers in the passes of the Kindu Kush, finally decide that they have to rise up against the British and get rid of them. And it very nearly works. Uh, the East India Company has 132,000 sepoys under arms, which incidentally is twice the number of soldiers in the British army at that point. The East India Company has twice the number of soldiers in the British Army. Uh, and 132,000 of them uh, are, uh, are on the rolls in 1857 of those 100,000 mutiny, leaving, in other words, only 32,000 loyal sepoys out of, and 100,000 against them. And had the Mughal court been as good at raising taxes and fighting a war as it was at throwing delicious parties, painting wonderful miniatures and commissioning fantastic calligraphy, uh, the Raj would never have happened. But the, because of the total chaos, no one feeds the soldiers. Delhi is eventually surrounded and sacked by the British. An army of retribution is raised from exactly the areas we now bomb with drones, Waziristan uh, and the, the Pathans are brought down from Fatah. Uh, to fight against the mutineers. They recruit, the they, say to the, they say to the Pathans, you can have a free day, loot Delhi at our, at our expense. <laughs> and uh, and the, the Pashtuns come down in great numbers, they loot Delhi. Uh, in 16th of August, 1857, the British take Kashmiri Gate, lock the gates of the city, and murder every single male over the age of 16 in the city, armed, unarmed, citizen, soldier, insurgent, whoever. One of the great massacres. Today, it's almost forgotten in India. They remember the Jallian Wallabagh massacre, but it's Jallian Wallabagh is kindergarten stuff compared to what goes on in 1857. And uh, Kashmir Gate is taken. Fraser's house, where all the miniature painting we saw before was done, is one of the casualties of the, uh, of the uprising here, is it, after the siege. Uh, and then they go, and any Mughal courtier, any member of the Mughal family, is, has a bounty on their head. They're called back to Delhi and hung. The last emperor is sent off to Rangoon. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, end by reading the last lament of Bharashar Zafar, if I've remembered to bring it. I hope it's here. Um, just before he is sent off, into exile. Hang on, give me a second. Should be here somewhere. Sorry, forgive me. Has anyone got a copy of the last mogul here, by any chance? No. <laughs> I got the first three verses, but here we are, got it. This is the last verses Zafar wrote before he was sent off into exile. 
and it's dedicated to his wife, Zinat Mahal. And it's addressed to her. When, in silks, you came and dazzled me with the beauty of your spring, you brought a flower to bloom, love within my being. You lived with me, breath of my breath, being in my being, nor left my side. But now the wheel of time has turned and you are gone. No joys abide. You pressed your lips upon my lips, your heart upon my beating heart. And I have no wish to fall in love again. For they who sold love's remedy have shut shop, and I seek in vain. My life now gives no ray of light. I bring no solace to heart or eye. Out of dust to dust again, of no use to anyone am I. Delhi was once a paradise where love held sway and reigned. But its charms lie ravished now, and only ruins remain. No tears were shed when shroudless they were laid in common graves. No prayers were read for the noble dead. Unmarked remain their graves. The heart distressed, the wounded flesh. The mind ablaze, the rising sigh. The drop of blood, the broken heart. Tears on the lashes of the eye. But things cannot remain, O oh Zephyr, thus. For who can tell? Through God's great mercy and the prophet. All may yet be well. Thank you.